Well, I want to say a special welcome to those of you who are joining us for our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, in reality, it's Saturday night, and we are taping this after our Saturday night service, and that's why you heard a few people applauding. Some of the people are staying around uh, to participate with us. Uh, for those of you who have maybe never tuned into our Wednesday night Bible study before, the, the purpose of our Wednesday night Bible study is to allow us to go just a little bit deeper into the weekend sermon. And to maybe touch on some things that we didn't have time to touch on in the sermon itself, or uh, to review a little bit and maybe hear it from a different perspective. And uh, so it's going to be interesting, I think, for people who stayed around tonight, because you had just heard the sermon, where normally you'd hear the sermon and then you'd forget it in a couple hours, and then you come back Wednesday and it would be like it's brand new. So th this will be interesting for all of us. I have no idea what, what Pastor Kathleen was going to be preaching about. So. It'll be interesting now to see what I have to say based on what she had to say, don't you think? You're all ready to leave. Okay. Uh, so let's just let's, uh, get into it. So what we're looking at is we're looking at a story from Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. And uh, we've sort of titled this Jesus and the Interruptions. So here's some background to the story. The last couple weeks we saw that Jesus got into a boat and went across the sea or the Sea of Galilee, to the other side of the lake. And we know that when Jesus got into that boat to make that trip, that he was already exhausted because he fell asleep in the boat, and he was so exhausted that he didn't even know there was a storm raging around him. So he gets this little bit of a nap, not much, and the disciples wake him up, and he has to calm this storm. They go over to the other side of the lake, which is the pagan side of the lake, the Gentile side of the lake, and he has to do battle with a man filled with 6,000 demons. So after he does that, he gets back in the boat, they go back to the other side of the lake. So imagine now how exhausted Jesus must be, and as soon as he gets off the boat, somebody else comes at him with a need, and this is an important one. Uh, it says this, when Jesus had crossed over by boat, to the other side of the lake, back to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He earnestly pleaded with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So any parent, as Pastor Kathleen mentioned, any parent, any grandparent, any uncle, any aunt, anybody who loves children can relate with this man's desperation. And this man is desperate. His daughter is dying. Nothing can be done for her. And Jesus is his last hope. And so what we see in this man is an act of faith, which takes on, in this case, the form of desperation. And I love how Mark responds. He says, well, so Jesus went with him. Now Jesus is exhausted. But this man has come and Jesus doesn't think twice. He doesn't say, you know what? She'll be okay. I'll come back tomorrow. He doesn't say, look, I, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I can't do this. He said, sure, I'll come. And so they go. And as they are walking along, a large crowd followed him and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and sp spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Now, for those of you who didn't maybe hear the sermon from this weekend, this is a woman who has several different issues going on in her life. She's got a physical disease where she's been bleeding for 12 years. She's got a spiritual disease. Because of her bleeding, she is ceremonially unclean, which means she can't go to worship. She's got a social illness. Because of her bleeding, she is cursed by God, and people don't want to be around her. And she's got a, a financial problem. She's spent all of her money. She's broke. She's destitute. And like Jairus, she is desperate. And her desperation becomes her act of faith. So she, when she heard about Jesus... She came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I can touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Now, this is really interesting, don't you think? If I can touch his clothes. There was a, a belief back in those days that the Messiah, if you would touch the hem of his garment, you would be healed. 
And so a lot of men would add extra layers of hem to their garments and flash them around, hoping that if someone touched them, they'd be healed, and they'd find out that they were the Messiah. And so it would be a natural thing. If you think Jesus is the Messiah, the way you're going to know that, you'll touch the hem of his garment, and you'll be healed. That's what she does. That's why she goes for the hem of his garment, rather than going face to face like Jairus does. Plus, she's a woman. She's an outcast. She doesn't want to show her face. In and out, as soon as she can, touch the garment, home, Bob's your uncle. So she touches him, the hem of his garment, and immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Isn't that a great language? At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out of him. He turned around in the crowd asking, who touched my clothes? And the disciples say, well, look, all these people are crowding around you. What do you mean who touched your clothes? Probably a zillion people touched you. Why are you asking this question? Now, it's a good question to ask because they recognize the urgency of the moment. This synagogue leader is desperate. His daughter's dying. And as Pastor Kathleen mentioned in the sermon, imagine being that guy. He's in a hurry. His daughter doesn't have much time. He needs Jesus to get to the house, and now Jesus stops to find out who's touching his clothes, for heaven's sake. He's got to be panicked. Now, the disciples don't know that Jesus felt power go out of him. And Jesus certainly could have gone on his way because the woman was healed. He knew that. So why was it that he took that moment to stop? Why was it he was willing to risk the life of Jairus' daughter to stop and talk to whomever had touched him? So this is a man, or this is a woman, who has been cut off from all society. This is a woman who is destitute, This is a woman who probably hasn't had any form of community for years. And Jesus looks around to see who had done it. The woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. And so imagine now Jairus is having to sit there listening to this whole thing. Okay, get on with it, get on with it. Oh, no, but there's 12 12 years of doctors. I spent all my money. You know, the the guy's going to blow up here in a moment. And Jesus says to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So why did Jesus stop when he really didn't need to? She's well. Because I think one of the things Jesus wanted to do is he wanted to connect a verbal blessing to her healing. He wanted to affirm, yes, what you think happened in your body is real. You're not imagining it. Go home. You've been freed. But I think he also stopped, uh, and Pastor Kathleen mentioned this beautifully, Because he wanted to bless her with a new identity. You are no longer this woman who bleeds. You are no longer this pariah to society. You're a daughter. And you are a daughter who belongs back now with your Jewish friends and your Jewish faith family. Not only has your physical body been restored, but your community has been restored. Your ability to worship has been restored. All of this has happened, and it all comes when Jesus says, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Now, Jesus is still talking to her while Jesus is still speaking. So he's still talking to this woman, and he's interrupted again when we get the bad news that it's too late. Jairus' daughter has died. So now imagine all of that stuff going on in Jairus at that moment. Not only is he devastated because his daughter is dead, But if I'm Jairus, my grief is now anger at that woman who killed my daughter. How else could I see it at that moment, right? I would be livid at that woman for taking up Jesus' time. She could have been healed any time. She'd been sick for 12 years. What was one more day? What was one more hour? So I would imagine that he doesn't say it. But just because I'm a guy, I can feel this. I would imagine he's livid that his daughter has died because this woman interrupted. And yet, Jesus immediately senses that, right? Jesus senses it, and he says, don't be afraid, just believe. And maybe maybe part of what's going on here, and I'm, I'm just guessing now, maybe part of what's going on here 
is that Jesus wants to let Jairus know it's going to be okay by healing this woman. And by healing this woman, he's building a little bit more faith capacity in Jairus. Jairus, look what I just did. A woman who's been bleeding 12 years. Look what I just did. It's going to be okay. I raised her dead body back to life again. Now I'm going to do the same for your daughter. So Jesus keeps going. He does not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, brother of James. And when they come to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep, but they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in there with the child. He took her by the hand and said, little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. And um, Kathleen saw something in the sermon that all these years I didn't see. A 12-year-old girl and a woman who had a bleeding problem for 12 years. That was great. Did you get that on your own, Kathleen, or did you read that somewhere? Don't, don't, we think you got that on your own. That's how good she is. At this they were completely astonished. Jesus gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and then told them to give her something to eat. It, practical as ever, Right? Jesus just raised this little girl back to life. It's one of those uh, miracles in the movies where they got the hallelujah chorus going, and Jesus says, give her a cracker, right? Because this is what life is for Jesus. He just gave her back her life. Now, I hear once in a while, uh, I'll get emails from you folks once in a while, and it's a prayer request, and you'll maybe say something like, look, I, I, I know this isn't the most important thing in the world to pray about, but would you pray about this? Or, I know that God's got more important things to think about, but could you pray about this with me? Or, I know you're really busy, you're praying for a lot of people, but, but would it be all right if you prayed about this? And what these story tells us is that God delights in being interrupted by your stuff. And nothing is ever too small Nothing is ever too unimportant to bring to Jesus. Jesus is interruptible. And that's why he's here for you. 24-7. Doesn't matter what else is going on. He has all the time in the world for you. And so big or small, whenever it is, Jesus through these stories says, interrupt me. That's what I'm here for interrupt me, and I will respond, I will always respond with grace. All right, so that's just a little bit deeper into the sermon for uh, this weekend, Jesus being interrupted, and uh, I want to remind you that tomorrow night, Thursday night, uh, Tony and Lisa are going to be doing some worship singing at 6 o'clock on Facebook, and then on Friday, Pastor Kathleen and her family will do Faith 5. And then we will be back in worship together. Now, this is going to seem strange for those of us who are here because we're in worship right now, Saturday. But next Saturday at 5 o'clock, we're going to have worship, and that will be our live stream service as well. And then Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, we're going to open up a service, and that will be available to you, boldrecklessgrace.org, boldrecklessgrace.org, backslash reopening to RSVP. It's the only way you can get in. That way we can make sure that we are social distance. So... Uh, ba uh, boldrecklessgrace.org backslash reopening. So for those of you who are watching online, have a great night. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the Bible study, make sure you hit share, share it with your friends. And we'll see you on Thursday with Tony and Lisa leading worship. And we'll see you on the weekend. Thanks, everybody.